Hi everyone, we're going to make a prompt start to this session. So welcome to the session on COVID life and society. My name is Andrea Lacey and I'm the chair for this session. So for this session, all presenters will have 20 minutes to give their presentations and then there will be 10 minutes at the end of each presentation for Q&A. So if you have a question throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen on Zoom to submit your question. Then at the end of the presentation, I will invite you to ask a question. I will say your name, then please, um, we will unmute your microphone, then please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation, and then you can ask your question to the presenter. So please also note that this session will be recorded too. So our first presenter will be Don from the University of Arkansas. So I'll hand over to Don to share his screen and begin his presentation. Thank you, Andrea. Um, okay, so um, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, my name is Dongya Ko from uh, the University of Arkansas. And today I would like to present my joint work with my colleagues, Jing Pingu and Andrew Liu. Uh, sorry, I have to share the screen. Okay. So the title of the paper is Working in the Distance, Productivity Dispersion and Labor Relocation. Um, okay, let me, okay. So what is the motivation of this paper? Well, after the, out, out, after the outbreak of COVID-19, all the businesses were enforced to implement social distancing in their workplaces. But it's, it's not hard to imagine that some industries are easier to implement social distancing than other industries. For example, IT sector, consulting sector, or in banking sector, these sectors must be easier to implement social distancing than others, uh, other sectors like construction site, hospital, or dental clinics. So there is clearly a sectoral differences in adaptability, and this may call may create productivity dispersion across sectors. So in this paper, we ask two questions. One, what is the relationship between the sectoral adaptability to social distancing and productivity responses uh, to the outbreak of COVID-19 across sectors? And the second question is more related to the public interest. So what is the projection of eco uh, uh, economic recovery after the pandemic shock? So to answer this question, we first start, uh, started constructing a measure of adaptability to social, social distancing by industry. By adaptability to social distancing, I mean how easily an industry can implement social distancing. So, um, so after uh, we construct this measure, uh, now we uh, relate this measure to the responses of employment and productivity to pandemic shocks. And also we also looked at the relationship to uh, the dispersion of employment and productivity decline. And then given the empirical evidence, uh, evidence uh, we simulate a multi-sector search model to study uh, the projection of uh, economic recovery after the pandemic shock. So let me briefly show you um, our main findings. So there are two findings. The first finding is empirical findings. So um, we, show, we show that a more adaptive industry to social distancing has less decline in employment productivity to, uh, and productivity to the pandemic shocks. And also we found out that uh, less adaptive industries experience a larger dispersion of employment and productivity declines. And our results are quite robust with alternative measures of adaptability. And then given this empirical evidence, uh, now we simulate uh, a, a two-sector search model. And we show that the sectoral differences in adaptability induces uh, induce, um, labor relocation across sectors. But because of this imperfect labor mobility, um, uh, economic recovery after the pandemic shock can take longer. So let me uh, elaborate uh, these findings in more details. So we first, uh, we first construct a measure of adaptability to social distancing. So for this, we use American Community Survey of the US Census, and uh, we actually use a 2018 uh, one-year survey, uh, which is collected uh, from January to December uh, of 2018. 
So it's completely pre-pandemic survey, and it covers 65,000 populations. And there is one question that asks how workers commute to their workplace by car, truck, bicycle, walk, or work from home. So this question is uh, directly asking people if they were, um, were working from home um, uh, in, each, in each industry. <clears throat> So we use this survey question uh, to construct uh, this measure, the measure of work, uh, workers worked at home in each industry I. And this is, uh, this is a proxy for how easily an industry can implement social distancing. But advantage of this measure is that it's completely independent from COVID-19. Of course, it's a pre-pandemic survey. And also this, uh, we uh, calculated this measure direct, directly from the question uh, whether or not they worked uh, from home. Having said, uh, this measure cannot be, uh, cannot be perfectly uh, accurate. And let me, uh, let me come back to this point after I show this, uh, this result. So this is a share of workers worked at home by industry. And this is two digit industry, even though uh, the survey allows us to uh, go um, um, finer sub industry level. So the, the highest share is professional scientific and technical services. And it's about 15% of workers in that industry are working from home. And this makes sense because in this sector, uh, there are law firms, consulting firms. You know, these, uh, uh, these firms uh, may provide their service uh, easily from home. The second highest is agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting. And this is because, uh, for example, like in farmers, they have farms um, uh, very commonly adjusting to uh, their house. So many people uh, that, um, you know, don't have to, um, to commute to their workplace. What about the low, uh, low share of workers uh, worked at home? Um, so the lowest is accommodation and food services. And this is uh, mostly hotels and uh, restaurants. And their services uh, can hardly be uh, provided from home. And that's why the share of workers worked at home is uh, pretty low. One sector that I would like to point out is educational set services. While this, uh, this industry must be uh, one of the most adaptive industry to social distancing, because after the, the outbreak of COVID-19, all the universities, colleges, or public education, we transition to uh, online teaching. But, um, and we're trying to capture the adaptability of social distancing, but with this measure, it appears that this, uh, this sector uh, tends to have low share of workers uh, worked at home. And that makes sense because it's a pre-pandemic. And if uh, we are allowed to uh, teach uh, in class, even after COVID-19, then you know, that is, you know, our heart you know, prefers to, um, uh, to teach in class. But technically we are allowed to, uh, to teach online and even before pandemic, you know, uh, the online courses were provided. And that's why this measure uh, shows that um, this sector tends to have low share of workers worked at home. So in that respect, this measure uh, cannot be, uh, cannot be um, uh, perfectly accurate, but um, to verify that our results are quite robust uh, with uh, independent from uh, the measures that we, we use, we also constructed um, uh, that, uh, a measure of adaptability to social distancing by using American time use survey and also um, we, uh, we use a measure constructed by Dingle and Neiman's paper. And we show that our results, uh, empirical results are quite robust uh, with any of these uh, measures. So I think it's okay, uh, it's valid to use uh, this measure for our um, empirical finding. Okay, so now uh, using this, uh, this measure, we're gonna relate that to, uh, to productive responses to COVID-19. So we assume that each industry is gonna take up Douglas production fu uh, function and we uh, compute uh, uh, productivity uh, for an industry I at a specific time T. But there is a data, data limitation. For example, real gross value added by industry from uh, BA is quarterly data. But, and, and the latest, uh, uh, late, late, latest qu uh, uh, quarterly data available from BA is uh, first quarter of 2020. On the other hand, employment by industry is from BLS and that's monthly data. So um, the latest is, uh, is August 2020. Well, of course, it's a preliminary, but, um, uh, and then uh, real net stock of capital and components of value added, you know, these are all annual data. So we have to impose some assumptions um, that uh, the, uh, the, the capital and the capital income share in this Gupdog's product functions are completely um, unresponsive to COVID-19. And that way we can compute the productivity uh, growth from uh, the first quarter of uh, 2019 to uh, the first quarter of 2020. So let me show you um, our empirical findings. 
So this is, um, this is employment responses to COVID-19 uh, with respect to the, the adaptability to social distancing. So this is a proxy, the, the share of workers work at home is a proxy for the adaptability. And we plotted uh, the employment uh, you know, responses uh, across sectors. As you can see, there is clearly a positive relationship between the two. In other words, uh, the less adaptive industries uh, tend to have larger decline in employment and uh, uh, more adaptive industries tend to have um, uh, less decline in an employment. And there is clearly a positive relationship. And also uh, for the less adaptive industries, the, uh, there seems to be larger dispersion of the, uh, the employment declines. What about the productivity? Well, again, productivity looks uh, quite similar to the employment responses. Um, as you can see, uh, low share for uh, workers worked at home or less adaptive industries tend to have higher decline in productivity compared to, uh, to more adaptive industries. Of course, in, uh, the, re, uh, the responses are weaker than employment, uh, employment responses. And the reason is because uh, we're using uh, the quarterly data for this productivity. And the, uh, the latest, um, latest data uh, that BA covers is uh, uh, the first quarter of 2020, which only includes January, uh, February, and March. So it, uh, it, um, it covers um, uh, the, the impact of outbreak of COVID-19 um, starting in uh, mid-March. And so um, you know, we expect that the second quarter uh, of 2020 data is gonna uh, generate more dynamics in, uh, in productivity. So from this empirical evidence, we show that the immediate responses uh, uh, of employment and productivity to COVID-19 is somewhat related to uh, the adaptability to social distancing across sectors. Now we're gonna ask um, uh, how our economy is gonna recover from this, uh, this pandemic shock. And for that, we need a model. So um, we're gonna use, uh, use this multi-sector search model to simulate how fast or how slow uh, our economy is gonna recover. So uh, for this purpose, we, uh, we just borrowed a, a, a multi-sector search model from Cholder Rake and Weiland's recent paper in JPE. And uh, there's no, um, our innovation in this, in, in this model, uh, except for the fact that we put um, uh, an aggregate pandemic shock into the model to simulate the, uh, um, the recovery of, re of our economy. So let me go uh, quick on uh, explaining this, um, uh, their model. And, and then I'll show you, um, show you um, our calibrated results um, in more details. Okay, so uh, first of all, there are I sectors in, the, uh, in, this, in this model. And we assume that there is a, there's a unit measure of homogeneous workers. And those, uh, those workers are split into employed and unemployed. And there's also a pool of workers uh, searching for a job. And, the, uh, and employee workers are gonna be separated uh, with um, their current employer with probability delta. And both employed and unemployed uh, workers receive a relocation shock with probability lambda. So this lambda is gonna be the relocation shock across sectors or friction. <clears throat> and uh, matching function is, um, is quite standard uh, in search model. And also these three uh, equations are gonna capture the, the labor market dynamics. And for the workers, um, both employed and empl unemployed uh, are gonna receive relocation shock. And once they receive an uh, relocation shock, then they, rece uh, they receive IID draws of taste shock. And uh, this taste shock is gonna create bilateral flows uh, across sectors. And uh, the present value of uh, employed workers and unemployed workers are, are gonna be captured by these uh, two Bellman equations. And that's very quite standard. And uh, for the firms, um, this Bellman equation uh, is gonna capture the present value of a field job. And we assume free entry in this, uh, uh, in this model. And so we're gonna have um, this, uh, this condition as well. And uh, wages is gonna be determined by the Nash bargaining between firms and workers, uh, but we also impose uh, downward nominal wage rigidity. So let me, um, let me show you um, how we calibrate this model and how, um, uh, what the simulation results are. So we assume that each sector, so we assume two sectors in this model, and uh, we assume that uh, two sectors are gonna have um, their productivity following this AR1 process. So we, so we give um, uh, an aggregate pandemic shock um, uh, 
uniformly across uh, these two sectors, but the, the response uh, of each, uh, each sector's productivity will depend on the sigma and alpha. Okay, so the persistence, persistence of the, uh, the aggregate shock is gonna be determined by this alpha i, and so it's sector specific. And also the immediate response to the aggregate shock is, is gonna be captured by the sigma. Again, that's uh, sector specific. So we're gonna incorporate our empirical evidence uh, to uh, this model and see how our economy is gonna recover. So we assume that sector one is less adaptive to social distancing and sector two is less ad uh, more adaptive to social distancing. So uh, we're gonna set these, uh, these parameters for sigma and alpha. And other uh, parameter va values are you know, from uh, their paper. So let me show you the impulse responses to pandemic shock uh, for the benchmark case. So first of all, when you look at uh, sector productivity, uh, sector one takes longer time and a uh, larger decline of uh, productivity after the shock at time zero uh, compared to, the, to sector two. Then uh, the sector, uh, mar sector market tightness uh, is gonna drop uh, for, for uh, sector one uh, at a larger degree and it takes, takes uh, more time to recover um, from this shock. And that's due to the fact that job search is going to rise uh, rapidly in sector two, but there is a gradual decline of uh, job search in sector one. And this gradual decline is due to uh, the relocation friction. So in sector two, um, not only sec uh, workers in sector two are going to search for jobs, but also uh, people um, from uh, sector one is going to uh, inflow to the, the sector two and look for, for a job. And that's why uh, there is a rapid increase in job search in sector two. And also uh, there is a response uh, of um, vacancy for the sector two, uh, which is gonna be higher, but it remains low in sector, sector one. So what happens to the unemployment in each sector? As you can see, there is one time increase in, um, in unemployment in sector one, then uh, there is a decline of this unemployment uh, afterwards. And that's because um, you know, uh, workers in sector one is gonna uh, you know, be reallocated to sector two. And that's why uh, unemployment in sector two uh, has a rapid rise um, after uh, the, uh, the pandemic shock. So in aggregate, there is one time uh, increase in um, unemployment rate and then there is a gradual decline of unemployment, uh, but um, still it takes about like um, 12 months to recover from this one-time shock. But I would like to mention that this is a very optimistic projection in a sense that we assume just in a one-time shock, pandemic shock to our economy, but in reality, we have second waves, third waves, and you know, we haven't taken into account those, um, uh, those waves in this model. So now let me, um, uh, let me show you a little bit of um, you know, counterfactuals uh, with, the, with the, uh, the model parameters. So first counterfactual is to change um, uh, the persistence of shock, uh, persistence of shock in sector one. In other words, what if uh, this less adaptive uh, industry can, uh, can adjust their productivity in a, in a uh, faster manner? So the productivity is gonna recover pretty quick. Uh, compared to the benchmark case. But then now market tightness is gonna fall uh, just um, half of uh, the benchmark case. And that's due to the, f uh, that's, uh, due to the fact that job search is, uh, is not gonna rise uh, for both sectors and vacancy is not gonna um, uh, drop too much. Uh, so given the fact that uh, the productivity in sector one is gonna recover pretty soon, there's not gonna be you know, that much of relocation across sectors. And also uh, sector unemployment uh, remains to be very low uh, in both sectors. And so in aggregate, unemployment increase is, uh, uh, is gonna be suppressed to more than half of uh, benchmark case and economies is gonna recover pretty soon. So what do we learn from this, uh, this uh, experiment? Well, if uh, policymakers uh, can uh, make any kind of um, um, uh, uh, policy to, uh, to make our economy recover uh, pretty soon, then probably uh, they can help uh, some of the less adaptive industries to recover their productivity in a faster manner. Another uh, experiment that we did was, um, was with uh, labor, uh, reloca uh, labor relocation friction, this lambda. So what if there's no relocation allowed uh, across sectors? Or what if there is a perfect mobility across sectors? Well, uh, if there is no labor re uh, relocation across sectors, then there is uh, an increase in job search um, in sector one, but not much in sector two. 
So unemployment is going to rise uh, even larger in sector one, uh, but uh, unemployment in sector two remains very low. And so in aggregate, there is going to be even larger unemployment uh, 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 impact uh, after the shock, and it takes longer time to recover from uh, this pandemic shock. On the other hand, if we allow perfect mobility across sectors, then um, there is a rapid rise of uh, unemployment in sector, uh, sector two, and also there is a rapid uh, decline of unemployment in sector, sector one, because there's, uh, there's gonna be more frequent um, uh, relocation uh, workers across sectors. But in aggregate, the effects remains uh, uh, quite minor compared to the benchmark case. Um, uh, so this implies that uh, making um, uh, uh, smoother relocation of, uh, re relocation of workers across sectors may not have um, a dramatic impact on uh, economic recovery, but still um, uh, restricting uh, relocation of workers across sectors may have um, um, bigger impact on our uh, economic uh, recovery. Uh, it may slow down our uh, economic recovery. So let me conclude. Uh, so what we found was um, uh, more adaptive industry to social distancing has less decline in employment and productivity to the pandemic shocks. And also dispersion is larger for the less adaptive industries. And given this empirical evidence, we show that uh, sectoral differences in adaptability induce the labor, uh, relocation labor, but imperfect labor mobility uh, can cause a long lasting economic recovery. So that's, um, that's pretty much about uh, my paper, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks very much, Don. Um, so we haven't had any questions come through on the Q&A button, so um, I'd just like to invite anyone who does have any questions to indicate so in the Q&A button now. Um, while people are doing that, I had a question. Um, sure. So you mentioned that the, it could take you know, 12 months to recover from these sorts of shocks, but that doesn't account for a second wave or any change in circumstance. Is there any plans to replicate this research to take account of that now that the situation is evolving? Yeah, so uh, we we can do that. Um, basically, um, you know, we just take into account. Uh, so for for our um, uh, simulation, we assume you know two sectors, but in uh, uh, in our empirical evidence, uh, there are many industries. And so uh, what, one thing that we can do is um, we can just um, um, calibrate our, our model as close to uh, to the real economy. So, um, you know, some industries may have, you know, uh, less adapt, uh, less uh, adapt, uh, adaptability, social distancing, some industries may, you know, uh, have, you know, higher uh, adaptability, social distancing, and we can match all these, um, all these industries uh, to, um, to get closer to the real data. And then uh, from the, from that point on, um, uh, we can also manipulate uh, uh, the aggregate shocks that economies are, are receiving. And that is going to give us a more realistic uh, projection of economic uh, recovery. Sure. So uh, there is a lot of room to uh, to do um, uh, to get closer to the real economy. But you know, for um, this experiment, you know, it's more of a qualitative um, you know, simulation. I would say. Of course. Thank you. Thanks. So final calls for any other Q and A before we go on to our next presenter. doesn't look like anything has come through. Um, so if that's okay with everyone, we shall move on to the next presenter. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Aidan, who is going to talk us through his presentation. So if I can invite you to unmute yourself and share your screen, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I don't know if you can see my slides. I am having little problems here. We can see, okay. Okay, perfect. So, well, thanks so much, Andrea. Um, my name is Adan Silverio Murillo, and today I will present the paper, Families Under Confinement, COVID-19, Domestic Violence, and Alcohol Consumption. This is a paper that I am working with Lauren Hohn and Jose Valmori. So, let, let me start with the motivation. Uh, 
one of the things that we more saw in the media is a big problem about domestic violence. In particular, there is this question, does the COVID-19 stay at home order increase domestic violence? Uh, our first reaction, immediate reaction is to say, yes, that will increase. Why? Because we see that there is a decline in income and if there is a decline in income, that will generate conflict within the household. And as a consequence, we should observe an increase on intimate partner violence. However, resident evidence that start to appear, start to show mixed results. In some countries, we saw that this increase. In others, nothing happens. In others, it started to decrease. And when we start to see within uh, the theories, particularly some economic theories, the reality says that many of these economic theories predicts that the impact on domestic violence depends on the income distributions within the household. So this channel is still not clear. And I think we need to start to learn more what's going here and what we are finding these mixed results on the literature. On the other hand, other limitation that we have is that we know almost nothing about which kind of public policies can work uh, in an environment when we have this COVID-19 and the effects on domestic violence. Uh, this is like the general scenario that we have. So in this paper, the things that we wanted to understand first was to try to understand what is the effect of COVID-19 on domestic violence. And the second question, our interest, is to try to see which kind of public policies can mitigate domestic violence in a scenario like COVID. So in order to try to answer these questions, we decided to use data from Mexico City. In particular, we used two kinds of data. One is a domestic violence hotline that provides services related to domestic violence in Mexico City. And the other is that we decided to use official police reports. Uh, this is very important because many of the papers that we are just watching, they use only one kind of information or, or, or the other, but they don't have both. So in our case, we have these two kinds of data. Uh, also, we extend that man, many of the period of analysis. In our case, is January and July from 2008, 2019, and 2020. And the methodology that we will use is an even study. So in the case of the Linea Mujeres, the hotline, this is interesting because they got information for calls related to psychological health and others asking for, for legal help. So what do we find? In particular, we find that the COVID-19 didn't impact domestic violence. I mean, we didn't observe that calls related to psychological health decrease. However, we observe that they are constant. And during some weeks, we observe that these kind of calls increase. In the case of legal calls related to domestic violence, we observe that they started to decrease after the COVID started. And we observe the similar pattern in, in the case of the police reports. This part is very important because many of the previous findings that we have until this moment, they assume that domestic violence is just like an homogeneous problem. However, we know that domestic violence, there are different types of domestic violence. I mean, psychological violence, physical violence, economical violence. And I think our paper is showing that we need to pay attention to that. If this is true that maybe physical violence is decreasing, it's not the case, it's not the case for psychological violence. And it's something that we need to pay attention to that. Then, other part that we were able to do in this paper is like we have the advantage that in Mexico City we have like some kind of experiments regarding some public policies to mitigate the COVID. We have a program of food assistance, we have support to micro entrepreneurships, and also we have an alcohol ban that was in some sense implemented to try to decrease domestic violence during the, during the, during the lockdown. So the things that we found is suggestive evidence that the food assistant and micro entrepreneurs maybe works, but we don't find any, any effect of the alcohol ban. So let me try to, to show you a little uh, this discussion about the COVID-19 and domestic violence. As I mentioned, it, it appears that there is a direct pattern, but when we started to enter to this discussion, we saw that there are many mechanisms related to this, this relation. Some of them will claim that we should observe an increase on in domestic violence. Others says that we should observe a decrease. 
And others mechanism says that it depends. It's very uncertain in the direction of the effect. Let me start with, with a hypothesis or mechanisms that says that we should observe an increase. The first is says that is the typical that we saw in the media. There is a decline on income that should increase household comfort. Uh, the second is the social isolation hypothesis. This hypothesis says that uh, when women lost contact with their families, with their friends, with people in their jobs, then they are more vulnerable to domestic violence. And the things that we observe is that this is the situation in the case of the COVID-19. They are isolated for their friends, for their family, for co-workers. And as a consequence, we should observe that there is an increase on domestic violence. Another hypothesis that is a lot on the media is that uh, the COVID-19 will increase the levels of alcohol consumption. If that is the case, we will lose our self-control. And when we lose our self-control, we are more violent, and that will increase the levels of domestic violence. On the other hand, there are some hypotheses that says that we should observe a decrease. Uh, first thing is that I said is very, women are with their perpetrators. So it would be very hard to report a situation of domestic violence if you are living with your perpetrator. The other hypothesis that says that we should observe a decrease is related to change in the family structure. Uh, this is a very interesting hypothesis because nowadays we have many nuclear families, but given that they, shock, they have a shock on the income, maybe many of these nuclear families, in order to smooth their consumption, they will go to live with their parents again. Uh, the interesting part is like when you move from nuclear to steam families, there is, a, there is evidence that there is a, a reduction in domestic violence. Then we have some theories that says, well, this is uncertain. It depends on what is the effect of the shock within the household. For example, we have the Bergen in power uh, uh, hypothesis. Just in the context of Mexico, one thing that now we know is that women were more impacted. They are suffering higher levels of unemployment. Also, they were more impacted in their incomes. So what does this hypothesis say? So in the case of Bergen in power, if COVID-19 caused women's relative income to decline, women lost bargaining power within the household, and intimate partner violence may increase. On the other hand, we have some theories that says that the shame will be due to unemployment. And in particular, they have found strong evidence that when male unemployment increased, then when male unemployment increased, that increased IPV. But when female unemployment decreased, then we observe a decrease in IPV, in intimate partner violence. So if female unemployment is bigger than male unemployment, then IPV may, may decrease. So as we can see, all these theories sometimes are contradictory. There are some that says we will increase, others that decrease, others on third time. So the only thing that I want to give you here is this big picture that this relationship is not clear. And I think we need more empirical evidence to try to disentangle what, what's going here. No, what, we, what do we know in this moment? Here, the things that we make is to try to see some papers that talk about causality evidence and uh, not just uh, reports from the media. And the, the first thing that we realize is that most of the evidence just came from the US, uh, particularly using police calls. However, we found that using these police calls from the, from the US, there is a lot of mixed evidence. Some of them show that there is an increase on, on calls on police calls, other shows that nothing happened, other shows a decrease, other shows that there is an increase and then so there is a sudden increase and then it started to decrease. Now, the next question that we ask here is like, well, they are making police calls reports, but do they really translate in crime reports? They really go to the, to the police office? In this case, there are few papers doing that. We only find one paper that is Rosset Al that in the paper, they found that there is a decrease on official crime reports in the case of Chicago. Another thing that is missing in this, in this evidence, what, what, what I think is very important, is like, as I said, domestic violence is not just an homogeneous uh, variable. There is a lot of difference of domestic violence, and there is little on this literature from the US. So there are two important papers that try to disentangle this situation which kind of violence is moving? Are all the kinds of violence, domestic violence moving? We are observing an increase in psychological, economical, physical violence. 
And the things that they start to observe is that there are different patterns within domestic violence. In particular, there is suggestive evidence that psychological violence increase and no effects on physical violence in the case of Spain and Argentina. So what we did, uh, so let me go through my data on empirical strategy. Uh, the data that we'll use is administrative data from this hotline that is called Linea Mujeres. And as I said, this is very interesting because they have information for uh, psychological calls and other calls related to asking for legal help. And also we have the police reports. Uh, the period is the before and after the COVID for these years, 2018, 2019, and 2000, uh, calls requesting psychological and legal services and the official police reports. And also all our variables are rates per week for domestic for domestic violence per 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, let me just go, uh, well, this table shows just the descriptive statistics of our variables of interest. Here is psychological IPV calls, the legal IPV calls, and criminal IPV calls. Uh, these are the years before the, the COVID. Treatment refers to the weeks after the COVID happens, and control refers to the weeks before the COVID happens. Just observing these descriptive statistics, we don't see any changes in, in 2018 and 2018. However, notice that in 2020, we started to observe that there is an increase, a statistical significant increase in the cost related to psychological IPV, but we observe a decrease in calls related to legal IPV, and also we observe a decrease in criminal IPV reports. So this is just that something has happened as a consequence of, of the COVID. In, in this table also I present some of the policies. So as we can see, there was a lot of variation within Mexico City. Some municipalities passed the alcohol ban, other passed the micro entrepreneurs uh, program. And also there was a lot of variation regarding the food support, regarding the households that they received the support during the pandemic. So my empirical strategy uh, we will use an even study uh, when these variables refers to domestic violence at municipality M at week C in year Y. COVID MTY is a dummy variable that takes the value of one at municipality M after three weeks the lockdown started. Then we include fixed effects by municipality by weekly uh, by the period and your fixed effects and this is our error term. So what do we find? Um, these are the results for our first, uh, even a study. In the first panel, I present the psychological effects. Uh, the first thing to notice is that we don't observe a decrease in the case of psychological domestic violence. On the contrary, there are some weeks that we observe that there is an increase, like week three, like week five, like week 10, like week 13, and like week uh, 14. In the case of legal domestic violence calls, notice that after the week three, we started to observe there is an important decline in these kind of calls to the hotline. Finally, in the case of domestic police uh, reports, the things that we observe is that they just started to decrease and then suddenly in this part, they are starting to go back, but they still didn't recover and they are still below the pre-COVID period. This part uh, we think is very important because um, it shows that there is some kind of heterogeneity and it shows some support from the findings that they found in, in, Spain, and in, in Spain and in Argentina. And notice that we have also the similar results for many papers in the US that there is a decline in police reports and also in the legal calls. But these kind of calls, most of the times are related to physical violence, which maybe it's increasing and we need to explore why it's happening here. However, notice that in the case of psychological violence, this is not decreasing. And on the contrary, in some weeks, this is increasing. That is the similar pattern that is, uh, the, the results are finding in Spain and Argentina. Um, robustness checks, I will not go over them for, for the time. Uh, we make many robustness checks. We make a bonding methodology to check for potential. Besides, we pass the parallel trends. 
uh, we check again if we have another potential omitted variables. Uh, also, we check for Y cluster standard errors. We have only 16 municipalities, so we correct our standard errors for that. Uh, also, another possibility is like some of the results as just a consequence of some municipalities. So we run all our regressions, excluding one of these municipalities. Then we also include population weights and also we include municipality specific site trends. Doing all these robustness checks, nothing happens and we maintain our main, main results. Um, let me just go for the, these policies to try to analyze what happened. Uh, in the first thing, we have the alcohol ban. In the case of alcohol ban, notice that this was a very important discussion. Uh, some people that promote the alcohol ban that says that that will decrease domestic violence because it will reduce the consumption of alcohol, men will less be aggressive. And other people said that on the contrary, it is alcohol ban will increase domestic violence because given that men didn't have access to beer, they will be become more violent because they are more stressed. However, uh, exploiting this implementation in these different municipalities, we don't observe any clear difference here. For example, in the case of psychological violence, we more or less observe the same trend in places that pass the alcohol ban with those that didn't pass that. And also we observe the same patterns here for, for police reports. In the case of the food support, uh, in this case, we started to observe suggestive evidence. This is not as robust as our previous findings, but it appears that in some sense, in the place that they passed this food support, we observe a steeper decline in violence police, police reports. And something happened, something similar happened in the case of micro-interpreters. Uh, notice here that, for example, in legal domestic violence calls, we observe that there is a steeper decline in this part when they pass this support than in places that, that they didn't pass that. Uh, to conclude, uh, this paper support the hypothesis that psychological violence increases and physical violence decreases. Uh, we think that this is uh, very important because on the first thing, we strongly believe that people that is working in this area need to use all the available data. I mean, they need to use hotline services, they need to use uh, uh, official police reports in order to have a complete picture about what, what is going there. And the other thing is like, we strongly believe that we need to see the different kinds of domestic violence that are going. Because if we just use one, we can go, for example, with the impression that domestic violence is decreasing when in reality some kinds of domestic violence never decrease or decrease like the case of psychological violence. Now, the next question is to try to understand for the policymakers, what, what is going there? What is making these, these movements? And the first thing is why is psychological IPV is increasing in certain weeks? Uh, the media and most of the times we claim and said that it's the alcohol. But the evidence from Mexico say, it appears to support that it's not the alcohol that is going there, and maybe these kind of policies are not working. However, some hypothesis that is more plausible is the hypothesis of social isolation, which remember says that the woman, when they lost, when they're isolated for the friends, family, or co-workers, they suffer more domestic violence. And maybe this is the case because given that they don't have this network that support them, they are looking at help for this hotline and in this sense, it's, it's some of the potential channels that may explain this increase. And recently, there is a paper from Canada that also found a strong correlation between places, between women that says that they feel social isolated with increases in domestic violence. Now, the next question is to try to understand why the physical IPV is decreasing. And also, we need to ask if really physical IPV is decreasing and why. Remember that we have some potential mechanisms. Uh, one of the hypotheses says that it will be difficult to report perpetrators. Uh, this sounds plausible, but if that hypothesis was true, we should also observe a decline in the calls related to psychological health. And in that case, we don't observe a decrease. So this hypothesis, but sounds plausible, it appears that doesn't apply to the Mexican context. 
Another hypothesis that we analyze is the bargaining power. Again, I remember in the case of Mexico, women suffered more unemployment than men. They were more affected in their income. And if this hypothesis is true, women with lost income more than men, they will lose bargaining power. And as a consequence, that will increase the levels of IPV. So if that is the case, this hypothesis is not helpful to explain why we observe this decrease in physical IPV. Another hypothesis that we think is very important to explore is the unemployment within the household. Remember this said, if the men suffer unemployment, that increase domestic violence. But if women suffer unemployment, that decrease IPV. So if women are losing, are, lose, are, are more unemployment than men, this hypothesis predicts that we should observe a decrease in IPV. And maybe this, this hypothesis explains many of the mixed results that we are watching around the world. And as more data is available, I think that this is an important channel to explore and to see if this is really happening uh, about these mixed results that we are observing. Another hypothesis that we said it also would be interesting to explore in the future is the change in the family structure. Remember that in order to smooth consumption, many nuclear families are moving to steam families. If that is the case, we should also observe a decrease in intimate partner violence. Finally, one thing that also we need to explore is like think if really physical violence is decreasing. Because one thing that hap could happen is that physical violence is maintained, it never decreased. The only thing that happened is that the woman value the risk of getting infected by COVID or going to report the crime. If this risk is bigger than going to report the crime, maybe they, they will continue suffering uh, physical abuse but they were not going to report that. And that's the reason we observe this decrease in police reports. So these channels are important. I think it's part of the things that we need to thank in the future, the people that is working on this, because that, that will give us a more clear idea about which kind of policies we should implement. Uh, thank you so much, and I am open for your questions. Thanks very much, Jaden. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, so we haven't had anything come through on the Q&A, so um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to pose using the Q&A tool now? We've got, um, we're running a little bit um, under, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, sorry, Andrea, um, I was trying to um, write uh, some questions on this Q&A, but there is no place that I can uh, write. Um, that could be the reason why we don't have any questions. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because we are the we're the panelists, so maybe we don't see the functionality. Oh, okay. Talking, I think. Um, but if you've got a question, then um, that is, is that right, Caroline? Sorry. That is I... correct. That is correct, Andrea. Yes. Bab. So, um, Don, if you've got a question, please do go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have uh, one quick question. Um, it's really interesting, um, you know, uh, paper and, and research you're doing. Um, uh, I was wondering uh, if your data has a specific information about the victim of uh, this DV, um, you know, domestic violence. Uh, maybe you're saying, you know, it's most, mostly uh, women uh, who are getting, you know, uh, some physical or, you know, psychological, like, um, you know, uh, violence from, um, from men. But what if uh, there are some victims, uh, uh, what, what if uh, the victims are like um, kids? Then, due to uh, the lockdown and uh, because of the pro you know, physical proximity between parents and kids, you know they have no uh, way to uh, to report any kind of um, you know violence they are receiving from the parents, and that may you know, partially explain why uh, the physical you know violence is uh, is decreasing after the lockdown. So I was just you know, wondering uh, if there is uh, that kind of information in the data. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, this data is very rich. So in reality, uh, we were able to go just for, for women that with married or cohabiting. In, in the Linea Mujeres, in the hotline, and also in the, in the police reports. So we are sure that we are just measure uh, domestic violence again, against women. Uh, in the case of physical violence against kids, there is another paper uh, that is working on that, and also using data from Mexico. And also they are observing the same pattern and maybe that's, that's part of the hypothesis that you said. Uh, they observed that there is a decline in police reports regarding aggressions against, against kids. I don't know if so, that answers your question. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're saying uh, you're only focused on uh, the, the violence to, to women. 
and yeah, there's also a, okay and there is also a, a research on uh, kids only you're saying yeah and there is one paper that is is i don't remember now the name of the authors but they are just working on violence against against kids so yeah they are completely different and we are able to exploit the, the reach of this data okay interesting thanks yeah thank you Okay, final call for any other questions. Okay, well, if there's nothing else coming through, then um, that brings a close to our second presentation. So now we'll move on to the third and final presentation of this session. Um, which is myself and Ellis. So I'll just share my screen. So Ellis and I will be giving a presentation on adding insight to the UK picture of the pandemic. So um, my name is Andrea Lacey, as you know, and I am um, currently working at the Office for National Statistics, as is Ellis. Um, so I'm going to be giving the first part of this presentation and then Ellis will be giving the second part. So we are going to be talking about how we've used the ONET database to deliver new insights to the pandemic um, related to occupational characteristics. So a little overview of what we're going to cover. So we're going to give an overview of the ONET database, first of all, for anyone who's not familiar with it. Then a little bit about the methodology that we apply to our project. And then we're going to talk about our two separate um, papers, which um, mine is the first one. So which occupations are at highest potential exposure to COVID-19? And then Ellis's paper on which jobs can be done from home. So initially, I'm going to walk everyone through the ONET database. So what is the ONET database? Well, it's, a, it's the US primary source of occupational information and it contains a whole wealth of information which ask a number of questions about individuals' working conditions and the day-to-day -day tasks of their jobs. So it contains um, a huge range of topics from what people's abilities are, to their knowledge, to their skills, their interests, their work activities, and the way in which people do their work. And it's really, really comprehensive. And it, some of the data is collected by ONET and some of it is collected by the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And all of the data is on a US SOC code basis. So it gives information about people's occupations and how they're done um, on a US SOC code basis. So this is just a little screenshot of what the database looks like. So it, this is a screen grab of the basic skills section. And whilst there are some differences in working practices between the US and the UK, combining these factors and applying them to the UK workforce um, allows us to do this estimation on the UK situation to add insight into our own occupational information that we don't currently collect on our surveys. So whilst there are some differences, we believe that they're broadly comparable to apply them to the UK workforce for our situations, though that might not be the case for everything. So an objective view is needed when you're looking at whether you can apply this to the UK situation. Um, so how did we use this information? So we basically took the US SOC code information and mapped it across to UK SOC codes. And we did this through a sort of two-step um, approach. So first of all, we had to map from US SOC codes across to ISCO 08 codes, and then from ISCO 08 codes to UK SOC codes. So I've got some examples of how we did that. So for example, if we take the occupation chefs on a US basis, this was chefs and head cooks. Then on an ISCO basis, this mapped across two chefs and then across two chefs on a UK SOC code basis. But as you can imagine, the drawbacks of using this kind of step 
is that there wasn't always a direct match from US SOC codes across to the UK SOC codes. So an example of that is on a US SOC code basis, the occupation non-restaurant food server, which then mapped across to street food salesperson, but also mapped across to waiter on an ISCO basis. And then on a UK basis, there was no UK equivalent occupation for street food salesperson. So we weren't able to match that across, but we were able to match across waiter to waiters and waitresses. So a non-restaurant food server mapped across to waiters and waitresses. So as you can see, it kind of got a bit complicated when we were doing this sort of few, these few steps and there wasn't always a direct match, um, but we were able to match the majority of the occupations that we needed to complete our analysis on a UK basis. And in both projects, we mapped our data across to the 2019 annual population survey to enable us to do the analysis on a UK basis. So now I'm going to talk specifically about how we did that in my paper, which occupations are at highest potential exposure to COVID-19. So this was a project that we did um, quite early on in the pandemic, looking at how likely different occupations were to be exposed to COVID-19. And to do that, we use two variables of interest, so two questions from the OMNET database. The first of which was exposure to disease. So the question, how often does your current job require that you be exposed to diseases or infection? And then the second was physical proximity to others. So how often does your current job require that you be, uh, sorry, how physically close to other people are you when you perform your current job? Uh, so both of these were taken from the context in which people work module. And it's important to note that both of these for this project were collected prior to the coronavirus outbreak. So they won't reflect any changes in working practices um, that have come about as a result of COVID-19. But we we accounted for that when we presented our results and you'll see a little bit about that um, a bit later. So the two questions that we asked, um, respondents provided a response on a scale of one to five. So the first around exposure, so how exposed people were to disease and infection, they could reply never once a year or more, but not every month, once a month or more, but not every week once a week or more, but not every day, or exposed every day. And then physically close to other people, physical proximity. Um, I don't work near other people. I work with others, but not closely. So for example, in a private office. I work slightly close with others. So for example, in a shared office, moderately close at arm's length, or working very close with others, so near touching. And then all of these were converted to a score of between zero and 100, and then averaged within an occupation to enable us to calculate these measures for our UK occupations. So now I'm going to talk a little bit through the results of this. So we found that there quite obviously was a correlation between exposure to disease and proximity to others. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we deem to be those that are at the highest potential exposure to COVID-19. But um, firstly, I just wanted to highlight the occupations that weren't um, at high exposure. So occupations that are really exposed to disease and don't include working with others include artists and agriculture occupations where you're not working closely with each other and you're not likely to come into contact with others to transfer those diseases. Um, the main occupations that we found that were at the higher end of the scale were health professionals. So it comes as no surprise that healthcare workers such as nurses and dental practitioners, unsurprisingly, they both involve being exposed to disease on a daily basis and they require really close contact with others. Um, but there is an important distinguishing factor to bear in mind that they are more likely to be using PPE throughout the pandem pandemic than some occupations would be. So that might um, 
alter the results slightly. But as you can see, they sort of feature in the top um, corner of our scale where we've mapped physical proximity against exposure to disease. And you can see there are many health occupations in that bubble. There are some such as psychologists that have less exposure to disease and less, um, they work less closely with others. Um, but the large majority of the health occupations featured in this se segment. And the next set of occupations I'd like to talk about are teaching and education professionals. So these have a lower exposure to disease measure than healthcare workers. However, some um, teachers and teaching professionals work really closely with others, um, with their pupils. So for example, nursery education teachers or special needs education teachers because the children are young or have additional needs they are more likely to work very closely with them and therefore more likely to be exposed to disease as well than for example secondary or higher education teachers who are at a lower exposure scale than these occupations. There are also um, an interesting group of occupations that may be at risk of exposure during the pandemic. Um, so these are the occupations where they work closely with others but aren't generally exposed to disease under normal circumstances. So because of the nature of these roles requiring close contact with people, employees in these occupations may be more likely to come into contact with someone with COVID-19. So for example, hairdressers, chefs, bar staff or taxi drivers are all occupations where the exposure to disease, in this instance, they wouldn't appear very high, but um, when we're considering results during the pandemic, they may feature um, at more risk. And something else we did as part of this project was we thought it was really important to look at the characteristics of the people who work in these occupations that are at high exposure and to look at how evenly or unevenly the pandemic has impacted different demographic groups or groups of society. So we did some demographic analysis and we found that 20% of workers in high exposure occupations are of BAME ethnicity compared with 11% of the working population. Um, so employees of black, Asian and ethnic minority groups are overrepresented in these occupations when compared with the general working population. And women are also overrepresented in 12 of the 16 highest exposure occupations. So there are more women in these roles than the UK average. And six of the 16 highest exposure occupations have a median pay of lower than the UK average. So we felt it was important to highlight these, these differences of how it's impacted different groups. And my final slide is just to show an interactive of how we presented these results. So uh, in my slides, I had a few screenshots, but fingers crossed if the technology works, it should be able to show um, how the tool can be used to look up any occupation on a UK SOC code basis and see where it places on the scatter plot. So we also presented where it pieces on the graph alongside the number of people employed in these occupations, the hourly earnings and the percentage of the workforce that are female over 55 or black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. So that brings an end to my section of the presentation. So now I'm going to hand over to Alice to talk through her paper. Thank you. So my paper also used the ONET database, as Andrea said, but looked at which jobs can be done from home. So we knew from the annual population survey, the levels and some characteristics of those who work from home prior to the pandemic. We were also very aware of government policy advising those who could work from home to do so. And as we started to realize and gather insights into the proportion of those working remotely from our business impacts of coronavirus survey, amongst other sources, we wanted to understand more about those who couldn't work from home. And the ONET database offered us a variety of variables that we could use to develop this measure of the ability to work from home. So if we move on to the methodology, 
In order to develop the measure, we identified five factors that are associated with being less able to work from home. So these are whether a job has to be carried out in a specific location, the amount of face-to-face -face interaction with others required for the role, the exposure that an employee would have to burns, infections and other hazards, whether the job requires physical activity, and also the use of tools and protective equipment to carry out the job. One additional element that I do want to flag here because it isn't fully reflected in the ONET database and therefore not in these factors that would increase the likelihood of the ability to work from home is the extent to which digital communication is integrated into the workplace and whether employees have the technology that they need in order to carry out their roles from home. We've explored this further in other analysis within the ONS, but it, but it is something to flag and to keep in mind with this paper. So going back to the ONET database, we selected variables from two ONET modules, so the context in which people work module and also the work activity data module. We rescaled each variable that we picked um, to account for the different ranges and responses across these two different modules, and then we assigned a series of variables to each category shown on the slide. We then, knowing that there, was, uh, there were a different number of variables within each category, we rescaled them to account for that difference. And then for each US occupation, we calculated an ability to work from home score uh, simply by summing the variables scores within the category. The higher the score, the less likely an occupation is to be performed from home. It was at this point that we then did the mapping that Andrea introduced us to earlier. So mapping it from um, the ONET scores to the UK SOC basis. So the analysis that we did uh, was designed to reach a range of users. So looking at our results, uh, we also used similar interactive tools that Andrea showed um, to give users the opportunity to pick out their uh, occupation and to show their ability to work from home score. But today, there are three different key findings uh, that I'd like to mention. So the first is earnings and how this varies by the ability to work from home. For this, we use the ONS annual survey of hours and earnings, uh, which in the same way as we use the APS, uh, we just use the SOC codes uh, from that survey. Then the second is the type of jobs that cannot be done from home, as I think uh, our focus as a project team was more on the jobs that can't be done from home and less on the jobs that can. And then the third point that I wanted to mention is to look very briefly into the characteristics of those employees least able to work from home. So if we look first at employees in the 20% of the workforce most likely to be able to work from home, the median hourly earnings of this group was around £19 compared with about £11 for employees in the 20% of the workforce least likely to be adaptable to home working. Because we can see it in the chart, it wasn't a surprising result, um, but by using the ONET database and using sort of UK stock codes, we were able to pick out particular occupations to track their ability to work from home and their earnings. So for example, chief executives and senior officials whose median earnings are the highest at around £44 an hour, they were un among the most able to work remotely, as were financial managers and directors with hourly earnings of around £31 and programmers and software development of professionals at around £22 an hour. Then if we look at the other end of the scale, gardeners who meet, whose median hourly earnings were around £10 were obviously very unlikely to be able to work from home. That's shown in our results as are carpenters and joiners with median hourly earnings of around £13 and elementary construction occupations um, such as labourers at around £10 an hour. Moving on now to look at the types of jobs belonging to employees most likely to work from home. According to our analysis, professional occupations such as actuaries, economists, statisticians, they're the most likely to be able to work from home. Jobs like these alongside management, um, technical administrative jobs involve relatively little face-to-face -face contact or physical activity or even use of tools and equipment that might be required in a specific workplace. But by contrast, elementary occupations including cleaners, waiting staff and security guards together with process plant and machine operatives, they're much less likely to be able to work remotely. 
Among the jobs least likely to be able to work from home are also frontline workers, many of whom were designated as key workers during the pandemic. So these include police officers, paramedics, and scoring lowest on our scale, so least likely to be able to work from home, isn't unsurprising as firefighters. In carrying out the analysis, we explored multiple APS variables, including some of those that reflect protected characteristics, but the variable that I just wanted to briefly mention today and show the graphic for is gender. If we look at the top 20% of workers most likely to be able to work from home, we see it's fairly representative of the gender split within the workplace as a whole, so 49% were women. But on the other hand, if we look at the fifth of workers least likely to be able to work from home, they're mostly men. 75% of workers in, in these jobs were men, compared with 48 in the whole workforce. Only 12 of the 103 jobs in this group have a majority of women working in them. Uh, and those really specific ones include police community support officers, vets and radiographers. Many of the rest of the jobs in this group are dominated by men. So for example, according to our APS figures, only 1% of plumbers, carpenters and joiners are women. Using the ONET database and mapping variables to the UK data, we were able to gather new insights into the pandemic and the experience within the UK. And so today's presentation is just being designed to show just a small flavour of that analysis that we've done using the ONET database. Okay, thank you, Andrea and Alice. Um, now we are open to uh, to uh, the questions. Um, well, we don't have um, any open questions so far uh, on our QA box. Um, but please uh, feel free to uh, type in any uh, any questions um, you want to ask to uh, to them. Well, actually, uh, I have one question to Alice. So um, yeah, I think you know this question is somewhat related to my work as well. But um, uh, so the measure uh, measure of how um, uh, how an occupation or job can be done uh, from home is not not exactly the same as saying you know which jobs were done at home after the shock. And um, do you think uh, is there a way to uh, to measure this kind of um, um, uh, the actual transition of uh, of jobs uh, to uh, to uh, to remote work after the after the shock? And also, uh, it would be interesting to see you know how this kind of you know, measure can be related to uh, uh, their their unemployment. Yeah. So, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think this is. This is really relevant to your work. You mentioned the paper by Gingle and Neiman, which uh, was really useful to us and was something that we were able to use as we explored different measures, of the ability to work from home. I think uh, you mentioned that who can work from home according to our analysis or, or who works in occupations that are most likely to be able to work from home may not be reflective of who actually has worked from home during the pandemic. Uh, that's, that's definitely the case and something we did sort of flag in our um, in our analysis when we published it was actually this considered sort of a pre-COVID world. So there's occupations in here such as teachers who according to our analysis would not be able to work from home. But actually we've seen over the course of the pandemic that occupations have evolved and um, sort of people that you wouldn't assume could work from home have been able to. So I think that yeah that is an important factor to bear in mind. Looking at whether we could update it, we now have uh, sort of more of the luxury of having some of our surveys coming in, showing um, actual data for who did work from home um, during the pandemic. When we started this project, we, we you know we didn't we didn't have that data, so this was looking uh, at what we could do quickly to gain a better understanding. Uh, but I think now I would look to to using some of our faster surveys that have come in and sort of comparing the results. I'm very looking forward to that survey. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, yeah, we don't have any questions on our QA box. So maybe um, Andrea, you wanna close uh, the session? Yeah, no problem. Sorry, I was just on mute then. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for attending this session and we can definitely continue the conversations on the platform if people don't have questions immediately, um, they can be posed through the 
through the conference platform. I uh, just wanted to flag that there is a short break immediately following this session and then there is the plenary session and then after that the poster session tonight so please do come along to the poster session later this evening. Thanks everyone for attending.